Op 10 juni vond op het KNS Centrum het seminar Teugeldruk plaats, wat georganiseerd werd door Menke Steenberg van Centaur. De hele dag stond in teken van leertheorie bij paarden en hoe je je hulp geeft. En dat is een thema waar volgens mij meer aandacht aan besteed mag worden. Een van de sprekers was de Australische wetenschapper Andrew McLean. Hij runt in Australië het Equine Behavior Center en dat is het meest erkende instituut op het gebied van gedragsverandering. Ik was erbij en ik deel een aantal belangrijke aspecten die Andrew vertelde over leertheorie die je direct kunt toepassen in de training van je paard. We've got to always remember that the horse is blind to what we're trying to do. He doesn't speak Dutch and he doesn't speak English and he doesn't speak German. Um, so we can, uh, what we do with our reins and legs and posture and our body is really the way we communicate with you. Maybe some voice, but that's how we communicate with him. So it's a language. So we've got to be consistent with that language. You see, what is really valuable about all of this knowledge is to recognise that we came to be able to train horses without knowing what we were doing. And yet, so many people are good at it. They learn by feel, in the same way that probably Mozart learned the piano. Um, if Mozart were to set about teaching us all how to play the piano, he probably wouldn't be much good. I don't know that he really knew how to break it down. He may have. I could be doing Mozart a massive injustice. But I'm just using that as an example that, you know, when you know something, you know it in your subconscious, you become so good at it, it becomes difficult then to translate it. The mechanism by which you translate it best is this. This is how you can understand it. So operant conditioning is really the, the heartland, it's the base of training. It's where you train the horse by rewards and consequences. So in particular, it involves the use of pressure and release. Uh, the use of positive reinforcement when you say good boy and scratch him on the neck maybe or sometimes with clicker training you give the horse food. Any of those kinds of things can change the behaviour because it makes the horse motivated. It's the motivation that works. So when you use pressure, which we call negative reinforcement, the pressure just motivates the horse to do something but when you release the pressure that's instantly the moment you know when you're saying bingo, well done, that's it. You, that's the right, right answer. The interesting thing about horses is because they're not the most intelligent animal on the planet, and I only mean this in terms of reasoning, they don't reason as well as a, a dog or other animals. You know, dogs, you know, can hold ideas in the head. You can throw a ball over a fence, and the dog will run around the fence, all the while knowing where the ball went. He's got to hold the image. There's never been any necessity for a horse to know that, so they never evolved to do it. And that's why your timing's got to be better as a horse trainer than a dog trainer. Now that's not me just guessing. There is uh, good evidence and good studies from Lincoln University showing your timing's got to be better if you're a horse trainer. You've got to go instantly if there's the right reaction. And that's also what we see good trainers do. Um, classical conditioning is where we basically use cues and we train the cue. And if you're reliable and consistent with the cue, so you want the horse to walk on uh, from a voice command and you've already taught him by pressure, you go pressure and he now walks and he walks with you, you could teach him a voice command by saying the voice before you give the pressure. That's the most ideal time. You know, it's the same as so many people, you know, go brrrr before they use a rain aid and soon brrrr means slow down. And it's a really good thing to do. It's, it can be very effective. That is all classical conditioning. So too is the light aid, because the light aid of the rein and the leg means absolutely nothing to a horse. If you get on a young horse that's not broken in and you go a light close of your fingers, the horse will wonder what that means, but he'll keep walking. Uh, if you give him a light leg aid, the same thing happens. He has got no idea what it means. But when you increase pressure, he goes, please don't do that. And then he's got a whole lot of choices. This is operant condition you get. And he may kick out. If you release the pressure then, you've rewarded that. So you don't want to reward that if you can help it. Whatever he does, you don't reward the, pre the you don't reward with release of pressure until he walks forward, then you instantly go like this. Next time, because you increase the pressure from a light aid through this to strong aid and then release, when you give the light aid, he'll say, don't use any more pressure, I already know what's coming. And that's how he learns the light aid. So it's again by classical conditioning, you see. 
because classical conditioning is all about him learning something that doesn't mean anything to him before, but now it constantly is associated with something he already knows. It's Pavlovian. So when you go a little bit deeper into the operant conditioning, negative reinforcement is really what you do. And I, I always use the, a slide of negative reinforcement because people misunderstand it. They, if they have a smattering, like a little bit of learning about this learning theory, they get it horribly wrong. They say, oh, negative reinforcement, that's really negative. That's bad for them, that's cruel. And it's not at all. Negative reinforcement is what you're all doing here at least four or five times in this lecture. If you sit from one seat bone to the other because you're a bit uncomfortable, you've just done negative reinforcement. You've just removed something that you didn't want to, uh, change, to you know, get a better feeling. It rewards the behaviour. So negative reinforcement is all about making a behaviour more likely by removing something he doesn't like. So obviously it's how he learns to stop from the reins, go from leg pressure, but it's all the release of the pressure. Uh, to turn from rein pressure and to yield from leg uh, from you know the yielding leg back position when you're pressing with the leg as long as you release at the right moment. So it's so very important. We call it pressure release, and the critical aspect is the release of pressure. It covers everything. It ha it's how he learns by negative reinforcement to become head shy. You put your hand near his head and he goes <laughs> moves his head. That he removes the pressure. They're really good at that. If he happens to, you know, with his head, move his head towards you and you jump out of the road because you don't want to be smacked with his head, he's just taught you to move. And uh, that feeds behaviour you don't want to happen. And I work with elephants, and elephants do it a lot to their young mahouts particularly. They try them out, and with the trunk they give them a little bit of a tap. And if the mahout just shrinks away, then the, ma then, then the elephant learns in the end to really hit hard. And horses can learn it too. So. Even on your saddle, when the horse reefs, that's why a good position is so important. Because if the horse reefs down with his head and pulls you out of the saddle, he's just gone, got that one under control, I can do that again, and it becomes a part of his culture. So they're all the things you know we, we try to do. So this equitation business involves two areas. It involves teaching people how to ride and sit well, and that's what the last talk was about in the demonstration, and I really think that's a fascinating area uh, with all of this uh, inf you know, technology. But apart from writing, there's training, and they're, they're different, and I think it's important to compartmentalise them and get your training really clear too, because good writing does not make good training, and good training doesn't make good writing. I'm here to talk about training. van het rantsoen van een paard bestaat uit hooi of kuil. Maar wat daar precies in zit, is meestal niet bekend. Mijn naam is Rob Krabbenborg. Bij PAVO ben ik verantwoordelijk voor het onderzoek en de productontwikkeling. Al tien jaar lang onderzoeken wij paardenruwvoer op energie- en eiwitgehaltes. En daaruit blijkt dat de laatste jaren die energie- en eiwitgehaltes langzaam maar zeker naar beneden aan het gaan zijn. Voor sportpaden soms zelfs tot onder het niveau van de behoefte. Energie- en eiwitrijk roervoer wordt over het algemeen aan koeien gevoerd. Het roervoer voor paarden komt bijna altijd van niet of zeer weinig bemeste percelen of uit natuurgebieden waar helemaal niet wordt bemest. Aan de buitenkant is niet af te leiden wat roervoer precies bevat. Hoe droog of hoe nat het is en hoe het ruikt zegt niets. Heerlijk geurend natuurhooi ziet er prachtig uit, maar heeft vaak een veel te lage energiewaarde. Sportpaarden hebben daar niet genoeg aan. Neem bijvoorbeeld deze twee balen hooi. Ze zien er allebei mooi uit. Ze ruiken lekker. En toch is uit analyse gebleken dat deze baal hooi een uitstekend energie- en eiwitgehalte heeft. Echter, deze baal hooi heeft een vrij beperkt energie- en eiwitgehalte. Deze baal hooi is dan ook uitermate geschikt voor sportpaden. En bij deze is het beter om hem in te zetten bij paarden die wat minder doen of misschien te dik zijn. 
Als je een evenwichtig voerrandsoen voor jouw paard wil samenstellen, is het belangrijk dat je weet wat je ruwvoer precies bevat. Ons advies is dan ook om een monster van uw ruwvoer te laten analyseren. Voor nog geen 80 euro krijgt u een keurige uitslag thuisgestuurd. En als u die uitslag aan PAVO doorgeeft, dan maken wij daar een heldere uitleg bij. Afhankelijk van de uitslag van het roevoermonster kun je het rantsoen bijsturen met krachtvoer. Is het eiwitgehalte van het roevoer echt te laag, is het beter om een hoogwaardige partij roevoer aan te schaffen. Als je paard op een pensioenstal staat, ben je meestal afhankelijk van het roevoer wat daar voorhanden is. In dat geval is het mogelijk om het rantsoen aan te vullen met eiwitrijke producten zoals luzerne of een speciaal daarvoor gemaakt krachtvoer. Vers gras bevat meer eiwit en suikers. Als jouw paard in het weidenseizoen volop buiten staat, is aanvulling met speciale producten in die periode meestal niet nodig. Hou daar rekening mee. Zorg dat je weet wat je je paard voelt. Vooral bij hooi en kuil is dat belangrijk, want dat is tenslotte het hoofdbestanddeel van zijn rantsoen. When you use uh, negative reinforcement, what you try to do in the beginning, it might take many seconds. You know, the horse, you might want him to stop. I'll take a simple example. You use the rain pressure and you go. Squeeze, close your fingers on the reins, he doesn't stop. Increase the pressure, he still doesn't stop. Increase the pressure, he doesn't stop. The seconds are ticking on, and now he stops, right? And that might have taken five seconds. He won't learn the light aid because the light aid was too far in the distant dark memory for him to recall it and associate it with the reward at the end, the release of pressure. So what you try to do in training is compress your aids into three seconds or less in order for him to achieve the light aid. And that is the key to lightness. Now, this is me telling you from, as a scientist, the scientific way to understand, but actually very good trainers have been knowing this for centuries. That's, what, that's often what their timing does, but they don't necessarily tell you about this shrinking. You've got, when you ride a horse, front legs, back legs, if you think of the front legs and you've got a right front and a left front, all of your transitions work over three beats. And that's one, interesting conversation I had with Chef Janssen. In 2006, I said to him, isn't it interesting how all the aids work in three beats? Every transition that you do when it's perfect in dressage, not in Western, because they do it in one beat sometimes, but to make it beautiful and musical, uh, the smooth reduction that we call a nice rhythm in the transition, it's over the three beats. So collected uh, canter to extended canter, Three beats, extended canter, collected canter, canter to trot. We try and make it all smooth in three beats, so the third beat is doing it. And Chef said to me, oh, no, I don't think so, I don't reckon it's in three beats, I've never really thought of it, I don't reckon. Anyway, then I saw him a, a year later, and his, the first thing he said to me is, you know the three beat thing? Yeah, that's what I do. And I said, yeah, I know that's what you do, because I've seen it on a video. But that's actually what, it's another example that, you know, when we know the structures for us mere mortals who are not chef or other trainers to know what they do really helps a lot. Habituation is where the horse just becomes used to things in his environment and we do that all the time you know and it's really difficult because nowadays the horse, the dressage horse is not the same beast as he was 20 years ago. 20 years ago he was the you know, the, the gun carriage horse, uh, the typical Hanoverian or Westphalian or something like that, just pulled a gun, and if the gun went off, he probably didn't notice. Um, he needed a fair bit of pressure to go. He wasn't very um, aware and sensitive. Nowadays, it's a totally different creature, and actually mostly arose in this country, because they're scoring better, they're much more sensitive. And that is interesting to me, because that's given me more work, because You've got to use this much better with a sensitive horse than with a dull one. With a dull one, you can kick and thump and do whatever you like, and the horse goes, yeah, I didn't hear that. With a sensitive one, you know what you get if you use too much pressure. 
So they're quite different, and that's where we need to understand this. And the one I'm choosing to talk about today is just the one that stands out to me the best. It's the one we use in our behaviour centre. It's unbelievably useful, and you should definitely try it if you've got a horse that's fearful of injections or clippers, you know, hair clippers, or um, not good to pick up his feet if he kicks out. Because overshadowing is based on the reality that the horse can't answer two questions at one time, which is again why you're definitely on the right track when you tr make sure that you only ever ask one question at one time when you're riding, with one aid at a time. <coughs> Your aids can come really close together like a symphony, like, a, like me with my speaking, and I'm speaking fairly fast. Maybe I lose some of you because I need to make my words slower. In the same way with the young horse, you've got to make your words slower. The more experienced the horse, the more you can run them together. But the horse can't respond to two signals at once. If you do, one signal dies. It, it, it diminishes and becomes less important. So the horse responds to the most important one. Now that's where overshadowing comes in, because that is what overshadowing is. So if you teach the horse to step back from rain pressure, and you say back, and he does one step back and release and forward, he might be heavy, but keep doing it until he's really light. Get him to be really good at forward and backward steps in hand, particularly when you don't move your own feet, so that you really know the pressure release works in stepping back. It's really simple. And then bring the clippers, and just at a certain point when the clippers come, and you ask him to step back, he'll go, I can't, because there's clippers. I'm doing clippers now, I'm not doing you. And you then the clippers have to stop wherever they are, maybe 20 metres away, and you say, back, and he'll, he'll go, I can't. You say, yes, you can, and you make him step back with a bit more pressure, release, forward, and very quickly he'll get back to what he was. Now you've overshadowed the clippers at 20 metres, and you bring the clippers closer, maybe one metre, and he goes, there's clippers again. And you say, back, and you keep repeating this till he's light. It's about a 15 minute program, it's not long, it's quite miraculous. Uh, and people I've taught to do it over the phone, <laughs> even, get really great results from it. I do it with vet clinics and whatever because it, it, it's a much better way to get horses uh, able to be injected if, than if they're leaping. Because see, the idea is what really happens when you introduce the vet with the injection or the clippers, it becomes the, the trigger for running. So the horse leaps and then they, your injection doesn't work. You know, you can't get close to him because he sees it as a trigger. But if you actually ask him another question at the moment when you think he's going to be a bit more disturbed and say, back, and make him do it back because he won't. He'll be saying, no, no, I'm looking at the injection in the vet. As soon as you do that, you've overshadowed the vet or the clippers. Ik ben heel benieuwd wat je van deze aflevering vond. Laat het me weten in de reactie op de website. En natuurlijk vind ik het fijn dat je deze aflevering liked. Wil je op de hoogte blijven van volgende afleveringen en al het nieuws rond de paard en lifestyle? Vergeet je dan niet in te schrijven in onze wekelijkse e-mail. Tot de volgende keer!